I want us just to keep going in this and to think about the fact that the battle rages on. And we, again, even in the last two weeks, there's more news of that battle that's going on. And here towards the end, I'll share some of those things that are going on, just some of the things I'm hearing about. But it's just important that we recognize we need to be engaged. We need to be engaged. And we're fully equipped to do so as believers because Christ says He's always with us. As we launch out tonight, and we're going to go back to the book of Exodus, if you want to go ahead and be turning there in the 17th chapter of Exodus. Father, again, I just thank You so much just for this day, for this place that we can gather, for another opportunity just to look at Your Word. God, may it impact us all. Lord, may we be changed because of it. Just knowing You have a purpose for each one of us as individuals, and You have a purpose for the body that You've assembled, the church, God. Father, there's things to be done, and until You call us home, may we be busy about those things. Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we had the opportunity, we, we talked about recognizing the opposition. And, and that battle is still for the souls of mankind. Um, the devil wants to take as many of those as he can with him. But again, Christ has already paid the price, won the victory over death, hell, and the grave. And we just need to be active in, in what that is. And we began to talk about combating the opposition, and it had some subpoints in it. And we went through serving. And we kind of started into interceding. And that's kind of where I want to kick us off here tonight. And we're going to look at verse 11. And, it was, and so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. As we go back, we recognize that the Amalekites attacked Israel uh, without any due reason other than they assumed they were their enemies, so they attacked. But as we look at this, and we see, and so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. Moses was very actively interceding for the nation of Israel in the role that God had called him to be in. And when he held it up, Israel prevailed. And then we recognize, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So what is the application for us as the church today? I want us to look in Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to look at verses 15 through 23. Ephesians chapter 1. Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, we can recognize that Paul here is speaking. Do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. In our intercession, as far as encouraging others, and we're going to recognize the importance of that. And I hope each of you have encouragers in your life. I'm, I'm so blessed with those that consistently encourage me. And they know who they are, and you know who that one is for you. Because encouragement is important us because if we think about it in our daily walk in the marketplace in the workplace we're not always surrounded by believers that are that are walking in the way of Christ and the world is constantly coming at us the world with its problems the world with all that's going on and I just need us to remember we battle not against flesh and blood but against powers and principalities so in recognizing that that opposition is always there so we need those encouragers, and do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. The spirit of wisdom, to walk in Him, is, is what that is. And when we walk in His ways, it's far beyond the wisdom of the world. And, and, the, and the Holy Spirit imparts that in us. We have to be careful to be, be obedient and listen to that. And I, I, I kind of got that backwards. First of all, we need to listen. Then we're given that choice. Choose to be obedient or choose to be disobedient. 
And there's times in our lives because of the things that are coming at us that we become disobedient because we succumb to the circumstances rather than the Holy Spirit. And if we will consistently seek to walk in His ways as He indwells us, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling. To be enlightened. That very verbiage of that speaks of us being lit up. And it's again from the Holy Spirit. And as we're enlightened, to be bright for Him in this world and, and the hope of His calling. Each of us should have a sense of what God's equipped and called us to do. And it'll be different in our families. Uh, as men, we're called to be fathers and husbands. Um, as children, we're called to be sons and daughters. As co-workers, we're called to be a co-worker, friends. As we walk in that, what are the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints? In the saints. I'm speaking of you if you are His follower. And the thing is, I don't consistently feel like a saint because of my choices. But God Himself says that we are and to walk in the glory of that inheritance. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power towards us who believe, according to the working of His mighty power. Power. How often are we challenged by what the world's bringing at us because we feel powerless? These scriptures, twice in these scriptures, His power is mentioned. Not only His power, but His mighty power as we walk in Him, which He worked in Christ, verse 20, which He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. Far above some, far above all. It is finished. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church. Christ is the head of the body in this battle that we're still in, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. The church is fully equipped to carry out the ministries of God, the very purpose that he's put us on this earth. And as we do that, to be encouraged, to encourage one another. And as we look at this ver these verses, to intercede for one another, recognizing at any moment in time, there's somebody that's on the highest mountaintop, and there's somebody that's in the lowest valley, and there's people that are all in between. And it's in any moment in time, in any group of people, that that, that event, set of events will occur. We need to be good encouragers, but we also need to be good at being encouraged. I struggle when somebody says to me, you know, great job. I want to sit into a long list of reasons. Sometimes all I need to do is say, you're welcome. My pleasure, my privilege. Because again, we need to be doing it for the Lord. And as long as we're living it out for Him, His reward is greater. And if we're doing it for that purpose, we cannot be discouraged in that. It's when we set out with the goal in mind of what we expect to happen, when it doesn't happen, that we can become discouraged. What if we did it for the sake of love? Because love has no thought of reward. I want us to flip over to Ephesians chapter 6. Verses 18 through 20. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. All is mentioned several times in this verse. All prayer and supplication, all perseverance for all the saints. That's something that we should be very active in. And for me, as Paul speaks, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Pray that prayer for me. And I hope you're asking others to pray that prayer for you. That you may boldly open your mouth. 
for which I am an ambassador in chain, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Conversation come up this, came up this past Sunday in talking about what does it cost somebody to become a believer, to become a Christian? I'm going to say in this nation right now, it's not that huge of a deal. But there's places in the world that it's a big deal because to become a Christian may mean you decide to be a Christian, you've decided you'll no longer have contact with your family. As we think through that, and, and this statement was brought up, or this statement was said, well, do you think that means they're saved? I have to answer that, I don't know. But this, it challenged me in this thought. A lot of times, we don't speak boldly because we're concerned what somebody might think about us. We're concerned what somebody might say about us. So out of that, and I'll deem it fear, we choose not to speak. Is that any less than the person that knows if they profess Christ, they can no longer have a job, they can no longer buy groceries, they can no longer live in the town they live in? It's persecution on a level we don't understand, but yet there's times we don't boldly speak up because of fear of, of what we consider persecution. We have to recognize Christ says he was hated. Therefore, we will be hated. And those things are coming in our country. And I don't want this to all be negative. That's not my point. My point is to encourage us, be strong in the Lord. Be strong in the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, fulfilling the purpose he's given us to fulfill. Let's go to, back to Exodus chapter 17, verse 12. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone, put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. These two men stepped into a role to equip Moses to carry out what Moses needed to do. They didn't take the staff from his hand. They merely held his arm up. They got him a place to sit so that he could manage, and they stepped in to equip. And as I think about equipping, we have to recognize as the church, we're called to not only be equipped, but to equip others. That term discipleship, in other words, a follower of his. Let's look at Matthew 28. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. We're seeing lots of alls in these texts. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always even until the end of the age. It's so clear in these verses of what the church is to be doing. And as we think through those, we are not left powerless. We're not left to do it of our own power. We are fully equipped. I am with you always, even until the end of the age. And as far as I can tell, we're not at the end of that age. Therefore. This is ongoing until he comes. Until we're raptured out of here, this is ongoing and the very purpose of making disciples. As a new believer, and God has gifted me with the gift of evangelism. I promise you that's not me, that's him. But to say that as a new believer, and I was very, I'm still very passionate about that. But in that, my thoughts were, if somebody accepts Christ, they're good. And I often share this, a baby, uh, an infant, toddler, we're going to say a toddler, four or five years old, if that toddler is left to live life on their own, 
They will survive, but will they thrive? I think that discipleship is one of the methods to helping believers thrive. And it's laid out in these verses for us to do. Therefore, I see it as a commandment that we are to do. And each of us should have somebody in our life that is discipling us, and we should each have somebody in our lives that we are discipling. Because that's the generational, that's the generation of the body. And the age of a person is not redundant on the birth. I'm a young Christian compared to the length of my life. I've been a believer 20 years. I was a non-believer 37 years. So definitely, just because I'm 57 doesn't put me as far along as some 30-year-old. Or uh, that's probably not right, 35-year-old. Point being, we all need to walk with one another as the body. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to look at verses 23 through 25. And I'm so thankful for each of you that are here this night and consistently come because this is one of the verses here in 25 that I often share with those that share with me that they don't think they need to be a part of a body regularly attending, plugging in. 23 says, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. That being Jesus Christ. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. The very reason we gather with one another, the very reason we fellowship, the very reason we pray together, we sit under the hearing of God's Word, we sing song, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. We are all highly aware the day is approaching. And no, none of us know the, the time nor the hour, only the Father. But we can see the events of the world and recognize how much more important it is to gather together and to encourage one another and to exhort. But if this says not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as far as I can tell, that's a command, not a choice. It doesn't say if you want to. It says, not forsaking. So we're called to gather together. And then he goes on and tells us the very purpose for it. And it's to equip, stir one another up, exhort one another. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. Verse 13. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua that, will I, that I will utterly block out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. A testimony. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. Since I began to study this and look at this you know, a couple of months back, The Lord is my banner. You know, I think about ball games and things. You, you, you think about a hog game. It's very clear who those fans are for because they're stuck in the windows, they're stuck on the tailgates, they're posted on top. Some are great big flags. You know, they make a special holder, that banner. Let us be our banner is the Lord. And then verse 16, for he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. This is a promise of God, and it went on through time, still going on. I want us to look at Romans chapter 15. Romans 15. We're going to look at verses 1 through 6. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification, the building up of one another. 
And we're surrounded by those that are stronger than us. They're more, not stronger. I won't use that word. That are more mature in their walk. We're also surrounded by those that are less mature in their walk. It's just the way of it. It's the way of life. So we need to let and serve one another. These verses are very clear. We're to serve one another and not ourselves. Verse 3, For even Christ did not please Himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. Back to the saying, WWJD, what would Jesus do? He came to seek and save those that are lost. And through that, serve as an humble servant. Verse 5, Now that may the God of patience, comfort, and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind, one mouth, glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unity. Unity in the body. Unity is not defined by continual agreement. To me, unity is defined by being willing to disagree and carry forth with the vision of that body. And as, as we are seeing God has placed us in a place in this body, and He is using this body, and we need to stay unified in the vision of that and what we are to carry out. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 11. And these are familiar texts to a lot of us. Hebrews 11. This is known as the faith chapter. We're going to start in verse 23. Persevering by faith. Verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child, and they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith. And we can recognize here, Moses had no power nor control over what was done with him as an infant. So by the faith of his parents, he was hidden. 24. By faith, when Moses had become of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. I would venture to say, as the world would see it, Moses had a great life in the king's palace. The best food, the best clothes, the best entertainment, and instead chose by faith to carry out what God had called him to do, by faith. 26. Esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater richer, riches, than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch him. By faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians, attempting to do so, were drowned. In any moment, in any of these events, Moses could have decided to go his own way. Instead, he chose by faith to walk in, the, in what God called him to walk in. And as we go back and think about that and what it's brought to us yet this day, let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verses 8. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if they're is any virtue, and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, 
these do. I have that circled in my Bible. These do. That's an action. And then there's the reward. And the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at your last care for me has flourished again, though you surely did not care, but you lacked opportunity. And this is Paul as he speaks. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Contentment's a powerful, a powerful state of mind. It's a powerful state of heart to be content. You know, in our lives sometimes, again, we get so focused on the circumstances, we fail to remember who is with us through those circumstances and that He can use those for a purpose in our lives. And as we think that thought more ultimately in the lives around us, as He uses those things to mature us, as Mike says, to give us a testimony because we're being tested, to be content. Verse 12 says, I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And then verse 14, and I want us to see this, Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. We are called to share. Um, in Matthew, he tells us to mourn with those who mourn. But he also says this, rejoice with those who rejoice. To be glad for one another, to encourage one another. And I'm going to finish up with this, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. I want to say this before, and I'm sure some of you have seen this on the news as well. And I remember, I think it was probably Monday or Tuesday, the first time I saw it, and I thought, well. But in Israel, the, the House pushed a bill that it was going to make it illegal to prophesy. In other words, for you to share your faith with a Jewish person, if it was an adult, punishable by one year in prison. If it was a child, a minor, punishable by two years in prison. I saw that yesterday that Netanyahu vetoed that. But as we think about that, I've also, in the past couple of weeks, I heard a, a speaker on one of the radio stations I listened to, but he made the comment that in the, in the last survey, Christian Christianity is the most hated religion in the United States right now. Why would that be? We're speaking of it. Battle rages on. Satan has a purpose. But so does Christ. And as we've looked at some of this text tonight, he gives us that purpose. Here in, here in Romans chapter 10. How then shall they, and this is chapter 10 verse 14, how then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed. And how shall they believe in him from whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And I, I know I use this text a lot. I want to keep reminding you. That word, preacher, in the old text was one who proclaims. That includes all of us as believers, a proclaimer. And how shall they proclaim, it says preach, unless they are sent as it is written, and how is it that they're sent? Christ himself sends us. We've gathered to be equipped. We're going to all be sent as we leave here tonight. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? Verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. May we be built up this night and encouraged, knowing He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Fully equipped to carry out His task, knowing the church is plan A and there is no plan B. 
And he's going to accomplish what he set out to do. And the thing is, he gives us a choice to participate in partnership with what he's doing as we actively serve him. Father, again, I'm just so thankful. I'm thankful for the privilege you give is to serve you. I'm thankful for the privilege we have to proclaim you, to profess you to others, to share you with others, God, that they can hear and know the name of Jesus, that they too can sometimes they change. Make the decision, make a choice to follow you or not to follow you. God, may it not be our burden because we've carried out your task that they have heard and, Father, have all they need to make a decision. Father, again, I thank you and praise you for this body, just what you're doing through this body, how you're using this body. God, may we recognize it is you and nothing of us. May we boldly proclaim you as thank you and I love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.